say who I am. That's because I'm on the run from creditors, but <laughs> no, I typically right away forget that we're being streamed. Um, I'm Bill Crane, one of the elders here at North MacArthur, and we're delighted uh, not only to have, of course, everybody that's here in person, but we are thankful for the technology that allows those of you that can't be with us physically uh, to join us online. A little bit different setup for this quarter, for the next three months. The elders of the congregation will be uh, rotating throughout the uh, adult classes as we st uh, study stewardship. Uh, there are handouts on the table in the back, so help yourself to those. The second page of the handout, uh, which is titled Stewardship in My Father's Kingdom, back and front, uh, that gives you uh, a schedule of the uh, upcoming lessons and what those les a brief description of each lesson uh, so that you will know here in the auditorium class next Sunday, Lord willing, Kelly White will be in here to bring you lesson one, My Father Owns It All. And so uh, then each Sunday after that, there will be a different elder in. Each of us have these uh, topics. Uh, the first half of the quarter, we'll go through the first six lessons. Uh, I'll be back in here uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of mid-October uh, mid to do Learning to Give My Father's Way. Uh, then we will start the second half of the quarter uh, that same way that we went through the first in the same order. And hopefully you're not thoroughly confused. Today... Each of us are in what is called our home uh, classroom, uh, mine being the auditorium, uh, to do uh, an overview, an introduction uh, for the study that we're going to, uh, to have. You may remember, uh, if your memory is better than mine, that we last did the stewardship series where the elders rotated throughout the classes about eight years ago. And then it was about six, seven, eight years before that, we, we did it earlier than that. And uh, we, we think it's uh, an important study uh, because when you really stop and think about our relationship with God uh, and our relationship with one another within the church and our relationship with other people, uh, who are outside the church, um, it really all is about stewardship, particularly when we talk about what stewardship means. And we don't, we don't do this uh, study about biblical stewardship uh, to focus primarily on our financial well-being that we are tremendously blessed, as you all know, in this country in particular, uh, financially. But stewardship, in, it, it includes our finances, certainly, but it includes so very much more than just our finances. Um, and we're going to look at that today. When you think of the word steward, i got to tell you, to be real honest, <laughs> sometimes the first word, that, that the first image I have is a racetrack. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but the, they have what they call stewards there to take care of the horses and the jockeys and whatnot, and that's their title. Uh, but uh, a steward is a manager. Um, uh, it can mean administrator, a custodian, somebody that is placed in charge of something they don't own. Uh, there's, a, there's an owner of X, and that owner decides to put somebody in charge of that. Uh, and uh, it can be a facility, it can be um, a bank account, it can be any number of things. Um, in the uh, poor example I gave you, it was uh, racehorses that the stewards were in charge of, taking care of. Uh, the Greek word actually, it's interestingly enough, for uh, what our English word is stewardship, is okinomia, I don't have any idea how to pronounce it in, in Greek, 
but it's what we de derive our, our term economy from, uh, meaning the management of a household in the, in the purest sense. But it also refers uh, to, as I mentioned, the responsibility that comes when one is entrusted uh, with the care of an owner's possession or possessions. Uh, and Paul even used the term, of course, to describe the trust that was given him, the responsibility that was uh, given him uh, to preach the gospel uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, 17. Um, again, we, we often think of stewardship as being how we manage uh, finances, uh, be it uh, in the church or otherwise. But oftentimes in the church, we, we talk about good stewardship, meaning the uh, good management of the church's financial means. And it, again, does include that. But we're going to be looking at it from a perspective that is far broader than just financial stewardship. And by the way, uh, from my perspective, uh, this congregation of the Lord's Church uh, has done a marvelous job uh, in being very generous uh, financially. Uh, they have been wonderful stewards in that regard. And the eldership of this congregation, going all the way back to its uh, inception uh, in 1973, it's been an eldership that has, has been particularly good stewards of the money generously given by the congregation. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, on, a, on a personal note, we are able now to make some needed and significant uh, upgrades to the facility because of the wonderful stewardship of the elders in the past over the last 20, 30, 40 years. And so uh, uh, stewardship in that regard uh, means a lot to me at this point in time in particular. Looking at Luke 12, 13, 21, this was uh, an incident you're probably familiar with, uh, but we'll look at it very quickly. It's called the parable of the rich fool, at least it is in, in my Bible. And we have two brothers who confront Jesus uh, with an inheritance dispute. And I can't help but think about um, the very sad situation when... Um, uh, someone passes away, usually a grandmother or a mother or a dad or granddad, and leaves an estate for multiple siblings. And those multiple siblings have gotten along reasonably well and been a loving family until it comes to time to divide up uh, the money. And uh, if the uh, person leaves a will um, and it's not to the liking of one of the siblings, uh, things kind of go off the rails. And if they don't leave a will uh, and it's left uh, in probate, sometimes they can go off the rails even more. And it's always so sad to see families in conflict uh, in that regard. Well, that's what's happening in this example. These two brothers uh, have a dispute and they bring it to Jesus. And while the law made it fairly clear uh, that the older of the two brothers was, was to receive the larger share, and the younger, the smaller share. Jesus didn't really get involved in the legal aspect of the dispute, but made a larger point about good stewardship because if you'll remember at the end of the story, uh, we uh, uh, have Jesus telling the parable about the rich man who had all sorts of possessions. And instead of thinking about how he could make wise use of those possessions and perhaps helping other people, uh, he, he decided to uh, invest heavily in what we know today as uh, pods. He decided to just get a lot of storage facilities and fill them up bigger and bigger and uh, stuff them full. Uh, and uh, Jesus uh, gave him a, a quick reminder. He said, you fool, this is verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? Uh, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. You've got to have your priorities right, whether it's about money 
whether it's about your time and how you manage it, whether it's about the talents that God has provided you, uh, have your priorities correct. And the, ver and the very first priority, the only priority really, uh, is God. Always think of it this way. Uh, try to do what's good instead of what's all about greed. So today, to better understand spiritual stewardship, uh, we're going to look at first two very important background points that are listed on your outline, and then three principles of biblical stewardship, uh, and then four general qualities uh, of being a good steward from a biblical point of view. And the first of the background points is, is extremely important, and it's the one that Kelly White next Sunday is going to focus on in his lesson. And that is that uh, it all belongs to God. And I've listed uh, three passages there as examples uh, uh, where it tells us that everything is God's. He created it all. Everything is, is his. And this is a great quote that Charles Williams had provided from Mere Christianity, the book by C.S. Lewis. Every faculty you have, your power of thinking, or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. Uh, I always think of, um, and we'll get to the story, of course, the the what we call the rich young ruler. And all of those things he was able to tell um, Jesus that he was in a positive control of. All of those things that the law either wanted him to do or not to do, he was either doing them or not doing them to a T. And then Jesus took it up one more degree. He said, well, you're very wealthy. Give away your wealth and follow me. And the, the fella didn't like what he heard. He went away sad. I'm hoping he changed his attitude later on. We don't know. We're not told. But it says before Jesus told him that, what? Jesus loved him. Jesus wanted him to understand that no matter um, how you compare yourself with yourself or with others, the standard is always going to be that much higher when you're talking about God. And, and, and we just need to remember that everything belongs to him already. So the second um, important background point about stewardship, not only is who's the owner, okay, who is the steward? And the stewardship is prescribed in the Bible. Biblical stewardship is pre uh, prescribed. Um, uh, all the way back in Genesis, uh, God turns over the management of his estate, that is the universe, to man, to mankind. He puts mankind in charge. Uh, and even in some passages of the Bible, and I think I gave one example in Leviticus, He's, he's pretty specific. Uh, in Leviticus, he talks to them about how to till the land and when to give it a rest and whatnot. But man has been put in charge. We are God's stewards. Uh, and he expects us to be good stewards. Um, and regrettably, all too often, I'm just going to use my case, I'm not as good a steward as I should be by a long shot when I think about it and pray about it. <clears throat> there are principles of biblical stewardship, and we're going to look at three of them. Uh, the first one, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. It's a uh, fairly familiar passage. First two verses of chapter 4. 
This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries of God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So we have been trusted by God with what he created in any aspect you want to think about. Um, uh, with the very earth and land and atmosphere that we breathe and where we walk and where we, uh, you know, I, I look back here at uh, Farmer Dale. He, he, he got these, the, he's got these flower beds just gorgeous, he and God. But he's done a marvelous job of making what, or taking care of what God has given as a good steward. Um, I think of another personal example I could use uh, about being trustworthy as a steward. Uh, a, a couple of years back, uh, we uh, uh, decided to uh, see if Greg Brown would be interested in, in being a, a building manager uh, for us here with the facilities. And it's, it's one of the better decisions we've ever made. He, he's up here every day, uh, and he's always surveying the grounds and surveying the property. He, he's always looking for things that can be improved. He's either fixing things or making sure things are working properly. And he's being a wonderful steward of, of, this, of this physical plant that we have. And, and that's, that's a great example of being trustworthy uh, with something that you've been uh, uh, provided with to take care of. And God has entrusted us with his entire creation. And it is required that we be faithful with it. We be trustworthy. Second, there's accountability. Um, and, and this is uh, certainly the old uh, boy and Girl Scout motto, being prepared. We need to be prepared. Uh, we're all going to eventually answer uh, to God. We will all give an account, um, as Romans 14, 12 says. It is inevitable. And uh, looking over at Matthew 25... Uh, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the uh, parable that, that Jesus told of the talents or bags of gold, depending upon your translation. Talents was the nomenclature for the type of money. Um, but uh, in uh, beginning in uh, verse 21 of chapter 25, his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And the man who had received one bag of gold, or talents, came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not gathered seed, scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not get scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, it would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For who, whoever has been given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The accountability is, is not about 
uh, to what extent you um, uh, did your job, really. It's whether you tried. Um, the last fellow that was given a small amount of talent or gold didn't try. He didn't have, uh, he didn't have the right kind of attitude toward God. And so he hid his talent. And regrettably, uh, some of us have that same problem in other areas of our life. We hide our talent or we sit on our talent uh, or we just don't make use of our talent because we just don't have the proper attitude about um, having been entrusted with something precious that belongs to our Father and wanting to do something good with it for other people. So we've got to be prepared to do that. Finally, as far as uh, principles of biblical stewardship, not only do we need to be trustworthy, and not only do we need to um, understand that we're going to be held accountable, ultimately, there is going to be a reward, and, and, and we need to know something about that reward. So first look with me over uh, at a, a very, very familiar passage, Colossians. Third chapter, 23rd verse, and following. This was in the context of, of uh, Paul writing about um, wives, husbands, fathers, children, and slaves. And in this passage about slaves, verse 23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be, with, will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Um, heaven is our ultimate reward if we do what pleases the Father. Um, we show our love for God in our obedience to what he has asked us to do. Now, he has given us free will. He, he didn't want automatons who would automatically or robotically love him. That would not be real love. He wanted people that could love from the heart. And we show our love for him if we do what he's asked us to do. And uh, the reward we get is the greatest reward possible. I think uh, there was a commentary that David Roper did, and I don't remember whether it was the life of Christ or whether it was Acts. It might have been the life of Christ. But in any event, he had a line there. Of course, David wrote a number of these commentaries while he was at um, Circe. Uh, working for Truth For Today for about 15 years. But also he had, as we know, uh, a long association, first as a missionary and later uh, there with the congregation uh, at the East Side Church of Christ in Midwest City where he got to know Dale and Sheila Hartman. And he has a line in the commentary uh, from a sermon that Dale did. And knowing Dale, it probably wasn't the only time he used it. He might have used it a second time. But I haven't ever heard him use it here, but it was a particularly striking line, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I didn't memorize it. But it said, everything or anything you can do in your life to get to heaven, it'll be absolutely worth it the very first second you're there. Something to that. You remember that line? And it was a gorgeous line. It'll be worth it the very first second that you're in heaven, whatever you can do to get there. Because what a marvelous reward that is. But of course, the reward's not based on or given on what they did, but what they did with what they were given. I mean, we had the one fellow with a, a, a five talents. We had the next with two talents. The one with one talent. The one with, wasn't punished because he only had the one talent because he didn't do anything with it. Um, 
Do what you can with what God has given you. It's not a competition. Uh, and and you, you're not to be comparing what you do with what other people do. Um, and it, it's, it's important. You know, that's the, the wonderful thing. We're not tempted, since we're, we're, since we're human beings ourselves and, and, and have uh, all types of foibles as elders, we're not tempted about what people um, give when they give of their financial means here at this congregation. Um, we don't, we don't, the vast, the, almost all of us don't know that. And the one person that does uh, tears up the pledge card as soon as he marks it down with an amount, not by name, but with an amount, and marks off somebody on a separate sheet that they've, they've purposed. So it, it's important that we don't know what everybody gives uh, so that we're not tempted to try to well, so and so is not giving as much. So I'm not giving, or I'm giving more. You know, so we don't we don't get into that, and we shouldn't get into that. It's each and every individual. We know what we've been blessed with, and we know what we can do, and what we should do, and that's what God wants. We are all blessed, um, and our faithfulness to God has given us and called us uh, to do something uh, with that. And so that we might, obviously, in the, in the final analysis, hear, hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well, now let's look at the qualities of a good servant. And there's four of them we're going to look at. Um, as different elders come through and do these specific lessons, uh, these will really, I think, be expanded out. These are more general. Uh, and I'll say something more about that here in a minute. The first one we're going to look at is faithful. Um, you got to be faithful to be a good steward. Um, again, uh, you, you must be prepared. Uh, you must be doing what God wants you to do. Um, because we don't know when God is going to come again. We don't know when our final day, our final breath will be, for that matter. Uh, you know, the, uh, I've, I've always had an interest, you know, at least in thinking about, and I've read some, but I can't, I mean, it doesn't do me any good to read about it. I, I, I just still have to kind of think about and wonder about. When a person passes away, when a person dies, draws their last breath, uh, and the spirit is separated from the body, and of course, I tend to believe, based upon what I read in the Bible, that that, that spirit goes to a, a place, uh, either uh, paradise or torment. It, it's a waiting place. Uh, you, don't, you don't go right away to heaven. But be that as it may, um, I get into those metaphysical things about spirit, and it's really difficult for me to comprehend. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is the... The um, attitude of being prepared, our judgment day, in essence, I've always thought, occurs on when we draw our final breath. We're not going to get another chance. We need to be prepared as best we can for that final breath on this earth. Um, the way the Bible reads, once we are physically dead, uh, our spirit's going to go to one or two places, uh, paradise or torment, to await the judgment. And on the judgment day, if we're in Christ, we're going to have the advocate that blots out our sins, and we're going to be found not guilty. Uh, we're going to be acquitted, and we're going to go to heaven. And those that aren't in Christ and don't have their sins wiped away, uh, regrettably, are going to spend eternity in hell. So, we got to be prepared. We got to be faithful with what God gives us, what God would like for us to do with that that He's given us, uh, and be prepared at any time for His coming. We already read 1 Corinthians 4 1 through 2, and, and recall it said, you know, we've been entrusted uh, with something from God. He's given this to us to do. Uh, we are God's hands, feet, 
voice, uh, and we're to be him on this earth. When you hear people talk about, I've never read a Bible, but I've seen the Bible, talking about how somebody lives their lives. Uh, we can be um, that very first line of defense against the devil if we think about it, the way we talk to people, talk about people, treat people, do for people. Um, so we need to be faithful with what God has given us. That's the first quality. A second quality is wisdom. We need to be wise with what he's given us. God wants us to enjoy his gifts. If you'll turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Uh, he goes on to say, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And that's what it means to be biblically wise as a steward, to understand that we've been given a trust, we need to be faithful with it, and that we need to understand that by doing so, we are putting together a pretty nice trust fund, if you think about it. Oftentimes we think about 401ks or uh, deferred benefit plans here on earth as it relates to taking care of ourselves and our families, and that there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But what's most important is what is our eternal inheritance going to be? Are, are we seeing to that? Are we thinking about that? Are we praying about that? Are we prepared? Have we been wise enough to, to understand how important our eternity is? is going to be. Um, we need to make that exercise. Luke 16 is that story that has always puzzled me, troubled me, gives me fits. Tim has preached on it at least twice about the shrewd manager. I still don't know exactly where I land, but I'm going to tell you this. It does make the point, without any question, that Jesus is... Rather than throwing, as they say today, throwing shade at this crafty, shrewd manager, he's saying, you know, we could use a little of that on our team. We could, we could stand to be a little smarter in how we go about presenting ourselves to the world. What do they say? Work smarter, not harder. But, but the point is, I think God wants us to be with, wise with what we have. He doesn't want us to throw away the gifts he's given us. He doesn't want us to uh, be silly and uh, not serious with the resources that he's provided for us to care for. Um, and and I, think, I think that's what he's saying. Uh, be trusting in him understanding what he's going to provide for us ultimately in eternity and in heaven, uh, but have the right priorities all the time uh, with what we've been given and entrusted. So we need to be faithful. We need to be wise with what uh, has been given us. And we need to be compassionate. I think within this term compassionate, of course, probably the overarching term would be we need to be loving. And, and by that I mean agape, uh, we need to try our very best to develop our heart in such a way that we really want the best for somebody else, even if it's at our expense, and even if it's somebody that uh, ordinarily 
we don't uh, associate with, don't really care that much for, but we want what's best for them. Uh, ultimately, what's best for them is for them to know about Jesus and to put him on in baptism and then try to, to lead the li kind of life that pleases him. But, but we, we just need to always want to try to help other people and, and be compassionate towards other people. Uh, the Macedonians, of course, were mentioned by Paul in his letter of 2 Corinthians. And in particular, if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians, I love the, uh, I've always loved the line uh, that he uses, the, the words he uses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he says, um, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people and they exceeded our expectations. And this is what I really like, this next line. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. That's the priority. First and foremost, God. Secondly, others, ourselves last. That should be our, that should be our uh, priority. Uh, we need to think of God first, think of our fellow man next, and finally, last of all God, uh, last of all ourselves. Again, we, we have the story of the rich young ruler, and there's three passages, they all three talk about it, <clears throat> um, that Jesus encountered, and in two, uh, two of them, uh, uh, Mark and Luke in my translations, it, it talks about how Jesus looked at him and loved him, thought, he really wanted to be helpful in giving advice to this young man uh, who wanted to know, what else do I need to do? I've done it all. I don't murder. I don't steal. I don't commit adultery. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just keeping the law one thing after the other. What else do I lack? And Jesus said, you know, well, you're very wealthy. Uh, take your money and give it to the poor. Come follow me. And that's not what the young man wanted to hear. The young man, in this instance, Jesus was thinking about what God would want. He was thinking about what would be best for the young man. But the young man was thinking about, first and foremost, what would be best for me. I'm doing, I'm doing what God wants me to do, and good for me. But then when he was told, well, there's just this one little thing that you could improve on that's kind of important, he said, well, I don't know. And he left. He went away sad. Head was down. I think we all go through that. I know I do. I'll think I'm doing all kinds of great things and then I'll be laying in bed and I'll think about things I should have done or could have done. Or, and I'll, I'll know that I need to be on my knees. Um, whenever, whenever Tim preaches... I appreciate the fact that usually, maybe not every time, but usually he touches a, a nerve of mine in some way that needed to be touched. Um, and, and I think God's word is like that. And if somebody's teaching and preaching God's word, we'll all have that little tug or should. So faithful, wise, compassionate, finally capable. Of course, what are our capabilities? Do you know what your talents are? And who or what establishes the standard for our talents? And where do we begin in discovering our gifts? Turn to uh, 1 Peter 4. Verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others 
as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Well, you might say, well, that's well and good, and I believe that with all my heart, but what is my talent? Well, you have to find out what your talent is sometimes by trying and failing, trying and succeeding, but you got to be out there. Somebody once said that showing up is 85% of anything. And, and I, I think that's very true. If you don't show up, that you're, you're already behind the curve. So show up and show out. Try, you know, one thing about North MacArthur, there is no shortage of things to be involved with. Out here on, on the ministry table as I speak, there's maybe three or four different things you can sign up for. Uh, in, in every newsletter, there is usually um, some type of uh, blurb or short story uh, about a, a project or a service that's, that's being pro provided by the North MacArthur Church of Christ. The elders meet on Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock. And we invite anybody and everybody that would like to come by and visit to do so. Let us know in advance. We'll put you at the top of the agenda. And if you have comments, criticisms, questions, uh, we also have the capability of having Zoom meetings with folks if they can't be there in person. Uh, Tim meets with uh, newer members or visitors every Sunday morning in his office. Kyle Cassie, our outreach involvement minister, uh, has what's known as uh, uh, next steps where he meets with people that have decided to identify here where they're given a, a, an entire booklet that they go through with all the various uh, things that a person can, can become involved in, whether it's teaching or leading singing or uh, going to nursing homes to provide service for, for uh, services on Sunday for other folks. Uh, we've got the uh, sewing ministry. We've got the community lunch. Uh, we've got the resource for the uh, folks that are addicted. We've got all sorts of things available to do. So you can find your talent. Now, you have to try. God wants us to try uh, to find our talent uh, and develop that talent once you've found, found it. Uh, what if you don't have many talents? Well, uh, that's why, of course, we've got uh, uh, Mark 12, 41, 44 listed there. You can read it on your own. You know the story very well about the widow that is noted that, that had virtually nothing. But what she had, she gave. Uh, and uh, regrettably, there are probably here uh, people in this congregation that might not have an abundance of talent. But you got some talent somewhere. Every single person in this uh, auditorium has one talent I know for sure, and that's the talent to pray. And nothing is, is more powerful than prayer. So there's one talent we all have, the ability to pray for others. Finally, I always have liked very much Romans 12, about the synergy that is created within a congregation of the Lord's Church. Uh, in, a, in a much greater way, it's that synergy of all the members doing what they can do individually together that makes a congregation so very strong and, and makes the opportunity for Jesus to be seen in us so great. Within an eldership, it's the same way, and it's why God, in his infinite wisdom, said there would be a plurality of men serving as, an elder, as elders in an individual church because one elder might have this talent and another elder have this talent, and they complement and strengthen one another. And, and that's what happens in the Lord's church. Your talent may not be the same as mine. What you're doing for the Lord may be different than mine, but together... Uh, we're doing something very, very important as stewards with what God has given us. Finally, to close, um, I, am, uh, I, I am needing to make sure I understand the, the roles here. 
Am I the Lord of my life? Am I in control of my life? We are taught um, and indoctrinated in this country over and over again, no matter where it is. You are in charge. Don't let anybody push you around. Don't let it be the government. Don't let it be anybody. Don't let it be. You're in charge. You hold your destiny in your hands. No, we don't. God holds our destiny. And we need to understand that. He is our Lord and our Master. God is the Lord of my life. And with all humility, let's take to heart the statement of Jesus found in Mark 9, 33, 37, and make it our guide through the study of stewardship. Uh, you might remember the greatest line maybe he ever uttered, other than forgive them, was if you want to be first, you got to be last. When, when he heard the disciples arguing about uh, who was going to be the chief of staff and who was going to be the assistant chief of staff, he was having none of it. He showed what it was like to be Jesus by washing everybody's feet. If you want to be first, you got to be last. Put God first, others second, yourselves last. Our objective in this study for this next quarter to understand and encourage practice of good stewardship uh, which includes our finances, uh, finances and our budgets, but it also, and I think even more importantly, includes a lot of other things, our time and our talent, how we treat one another, how we present ourselves to the world uh, as disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's have a quick prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father God, we thank you so much for being our Father we thank you for all the many blessings you provide us. We pray that as we look deeply into your word this quarter about being good stewards, we will keep in mind that you have entrusted us with your creation. We pray that we will be good stewards. Father, we're mindful of many who are dealing with pain and suffering of various kinds, we pray for them at this time and ask your blessings upon them. And we also know, Father, we fail you on occasion. We ask for your forgiveness. And we pray you'll give us hearts that are more forgiving towards those that would sin against us. Again, Father, be with us. Keep us in your word. All these things we lift up to you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.